<laughs> it's the Harv Har- 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 and Jay Jay Show. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> My childhood idol. <laughs> Theo Fleury, what's up, man? Much. How are you guys? Oh, we're great. doing great. I like your hat. Thank you. I think I need one like that. Cause you're yeah. you're sober too. I too have uh, been fighting a battle for a while, but I'm I'm winning right now. Finally, living a healthier lifestyle. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, making better choices. Uh, where Where are you guys located? Uh, Six Nations, near Toronto. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there. I've oh, been really? there. Man. Great. Oh yeah, lots. Yeah, good place. I've spoke there a few times. That is amazing. Yes. Uh, we we're just talking about getting you down here to go do some golfing at Mont Hill over there. <laughs> yeah, I say here you're an avid golfer. I'm in. Wow. I'm in. I love I love golf. Well, welcome to the Harvin J Show. We are so honored to have a, a very, very special guest today. Yes, um, childhood someone, idol of yeah, mine. Yeah, we grew up watching and idolizing, and we couldn't believe. Yeah. Um, Métis. Yeah. Um, Theron Motivational Fleury. speaker, inspiration. Everything. And Legend. We're gonna, and we're going to get into all that. So welcome to the show, Theo. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for making the time. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing great, you know. Um, obviously, I've never been busier, you know, with... Uh, with all the COVID stuff and people, um, you know, struggling with mental illness, addiction problems, suicides, you know, you name it. So it's been, uh, it's been crazy. It's been a crazy year for sure. And then obviously, you know, I have my, I have my own challenges as well. (laughs) And so, um, you know, COVID, COVID has been, uh, probably one of the most challenging years I've, I've had in a long time. You know, not only with dealing with other people's stuff, but dealing with my own stuff too. So right, because you're isolated and you're stuck by yourself, right? You can't be around the friends yeah. and the support system, right? right. That's hard for people yeah. right now. Well, you know, I'm used to being on the road. You know, <laughs> I, you know, before COVID hit, like I was somewhere different every week, and and uh, you know that kind of all came to a, a complete stop, and so you know we had to really. Uh, pivot quickly and get online and uh uh you know i created a <clears throat> i created a program online and uh we have a couple hundred members now that Amazing. we uh we support we support online and you know every wednesday i do like four or five of these podcasts and you know, <laughs> talk about you know talk about you know hockey or trauma mental health addiction suicide you know, you name it. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it's kept me busy, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm, uh, I need, I need a golf course. <laughs> That's right. Now. I hear you. <laughs> I just heard that, uh, the golf course Sandusk was opening today. Like, yeah. There was a like local a, one that's open like today a month before weather everyone permitting, else. <laughs> yeah. So we're almost there. Right. It's really important what you just said, um, because people are at home. That's the reason why we started this show is because everyone's stuck at home. Um, and, and we need to get that content out there. Right. And, and talk to people who have a perspective that can actually help them. You know, like right. we're at home, we might as well learn and grow. Right. Right. Yeah. I can tell you my smudge bowl has had a, <laughs> had a, had a it's, it's working hard. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's also good for the germs, too, the smudging. You know, clear the germs yeah. out of your house and the bad yeah. spirits. There you go. Um, and I haven't, I haven't been able to go to Sweat Lodge either, so I'm, I'm, due for, <laughs> I'm due for a good sweat, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to talk a bit about, like, you growing up, um, your grandmother was Cree, um, and it, your family had a passion for music and stuff. I, I just want to get into that a little bit, if you wouldn't mind going, taking us a little bit back to your childhood. Um, you were born and raised in Oxbow, Saskatchewan? Yeah, I was born in Oxbow and raised in uh, Russell, Manitoba. So right. I, I, I grew up in, in, uh, in Russell. My dad, my dad was an unbelievable hockey player. Wow. And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, back in the sixties, there was only what six teams in the NHL. Yeah. So, so my dad was like a hired gun and we spent, uh, you know, the first five years of my life, my dad was playing in different towns, playing senior hockey and they paid him to, you know, to play. And then we finally settled in this, uh, in this community in Manitoba 
where I ended up playing all of my minor hockey. And uh, my dad played for the, for the senior team and they gave him a job in the town and, and we ended up, you know, settling, settling in, in Russell, Manitoba. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your grandmother? Yeah. I read in your book, how, uh, she said she knocked three guys <laughs> out in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. That's strong tough. indigenous That's woman. Tough. I come by my, my anger, honestly, <laughs> because my, my grandmother was, uh, she was one tough lady. Mm. I'll tell you. I remember one night, um, at the local tavern, <laughs> I watched I watched her clean three guys in a parking lot by herself. You know, <laughs> wow. And, uh, but uh, you know, I, I absolutely love my Métis culture uh, because uh, you know, if you know anything about Métis people, uh, music is is mm. part of our DNA. Yeah, you know, and you know, my fondest memories as a kid, you know, were spent sitting beside my grandfather you know Amazing. watch listening to him play the fiddle you know my dad was a guitar player my uncle was a guitar player and you know my dad used to take me and my two brothers to all these talent shows wow. that were all over the place and we, and we used to you know we used to sing uh we used to sing a lot and so that's you know when i retired from hockey that's why that's why i got into got into music awesome that's the music we dabble in music ourselves. Yeah, a little bit. bit. Yeah. It's it's a great it's a great thing. Um, you started hockey at 15 years old, um, like in junior. junior yeah, and uh, junior hockey. Can you tell us a bit about your starting out your junior career? I was a part of the very first bantam draft that was held in the Western Hockey League. Right. So similar to the OHL, and I was picked in the second round by the Winnipeg Warriors, who are now the Moose Jaw. Warriors. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so when I was 15, I moved from Russell to Winnipeg and uh, uh, I played I played for the St. James Canadians. I can't remember what the league <laughs> was called, but every day after practice, I got or every day after school, I, I got to practice with the with the big team, Wow, which was the, the Winnipeg Warriors. And the year I was in Winnipeg, the team got sold to Moose Jaw. And so when I was 16, uh, I moved to Moose Jaw and I played four four years for the Moose Jaw Warriors. 160 points in one season. That's a craziness. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of points. <laughs> right? <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. Just being so young, like, so I guess watching your dad and then starting so young, it, it must have felt like uh, like a glove hockey to you, eh? Just as, as much as music? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was my happy place for mm. sure, you know, and... Uh, you know, both my parents struggled with addiction and, you know, uh, I went through uh, sexual abuse around that time as well. And so, you know, hockey was always a constant and hockey was mm. always, uh, you know, my happy place. You know, everything that I wasn't getting at home or wow. whatever, as soon as I stepped in the arena, you know, I got love. I got people who looked after me, <laughs> right. cared for me, you know, all those things. And so... And, you know, I also got instilled with some really great morals as well, you know, that I hold near and dear to my heart today. And, and uh, you know, all those lessons that I learned as a kid, you know, were a huge part of the reason why I had so much success as a professional hockey player, you know, winning a World Junior Stanley Cup, Canada Cup, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then, ultimate, and then ultimately, you know, uh, an Olympic gold medal, you know. You know, so and and all those uh, all those lessons I learned young in my life, you know, sort of transferred, um, you know, over to the success I had as a, you know, as a professional athlete. Theo is tenth all time still in WHL scoring. It's just amazing yeah. stuff. And you talked a little bit. You represented Canada um, first with nine the, different times, I believe. Right. That's amazing. Ten oh, times. Ten times. <laughs> ten times. Well, what was interesting was. When I was 16 years old, Hockey Canada developed the program of excellence. Mm -hmm. And so I was, a, you know, the, the first group of kids to go through the program. And ultimately what they wanted to do was they wanted to expose kids to international mm -hmm. hockey. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, and, and what happened was I played under 17, under 18, Two world juniors, wow. two world championships, 
two World Cups of hockey and two Olympic Games. And so <laughs> you know, that, that program that they developed, you know, they developed for guys like me because, uh, you know, they wanted to sort of uh, set Canada apart from every other right. uh, country that was playing internationally. And so, you know, the more exposure we got playing international hockey, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, it, it ended up with us winning a gold medal in Amazing. 2002 and they developed the program in, you know, I think it was like 1980, 1980. Oh, 22 years. That program. And, you know, you, you look at how big the world junior hockey tournament is yeah. now, yeah. you know, it was all started, you know, from this program of, of excellence. <laughs> That's amazing. It's almost like what they're doing here with lacrosse, eh? You know, yeah. um, they weren't just building uh, it from the, the the kids up to adults. Yeah, yeah. and they developed their own programs. Had they got their own arenas and got those their own conditioners and right. trainers and stuff. So, um, do you play any lacrosse, Theo? I didn't. You know, in Manitoba, we were we were a baseball. Oh, um, right. I love uh, baseball too. Yeah. yeah, and I was actually a better baseball player than I was. <laughs> oh a wow! Player. Wow! If you, if you can believe that. Wow. You know? Yeah, I think you would have made for a good um, lacrosse player because your size, yeah, and speed, and, yeah. and, and like your deeks and stuff, yeah. Cross checking and slashing is legal. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you played with Roberts and Newendike, who were two pretty good lacrosse yeah, players in go. their time. And also, yeah. it's not only legal um, now. The rule is if you're if they're even going for the ball within like nine feet, you can lay them out. <laughs> oh yeah, uh -huh. I learned that the hard way. Nice physical game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nations is one of the premier lacrosse places in Canada, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of players in the oh, NLL. Yeah. Hotbed. Yep. Austin Stotts, Randy Stotts, you know, all the best goalies, Warren Hill and yeah. Douglas Jameson, who won goalie of the year this year. Right. Brendan um, Bomberry. Awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. There's so much lacrosse down here. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, we play a little hockey, though, too. Yeah, we got some players. Uh, we got Brandon Montour in the NHL right now with, with the, the Sabres. Sabres. Yeah. yeah, so that's – he was the first right. one. Yep. Stan Jonathan from back in the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, classic. The tank. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Go he ahead. He was tough. No, he, he was, was one of the tough. toughest, yeah. <laughs> He's a nice man, though. A very nice guy. Yeah. But he played for that an organization like um, you did, Theo. Like, it's so deep in tradition. We were talking about that. Like, uh, when, when Stan played for Boston, he, he gets called to the alumni games, and when he goes to Boston, he's like a celebrity there still, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's crazy. And you, you, you had the same experience with Calgary Flames. They love you out there, eh? <laughs> yeah. That's why, you know, that's why I chose uh, post-career to move back to Calgary and, um, you know, and live here. You know, all, all my kids were born here in Calgary, so. Um, that's you know, amazing. We, we love the area. And we're 45 minutes from one of the most beautiful places on the planet, which mm. is the Rocky Mountains, right? So Nice. You can't beat yeah, that. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Um, there's, some, there's some unbelievable mountain golf around here. Wow. Like, unbelievable courses. Yeah. Have to make our way out there. <laughs> we we'll, do, we'll, dude. Yeah. We got to get Bell and say, yeah. hey, let's go. Definitely. <laughs> Um, I wanted to go back again to um, a famous bench clearing brawl back Ooh. in the juniors <laughs> um, against from Canada and the Soviet Union. Um, both teams were eventually disqualified from the tournament, but um, it's insane, dude. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that like how that developed? You know, around that time, you know, the Canada Russia rivalry right. was like yeah. the, biggest, <laughs> the biggest biggest in international hockey, and. Uh, you know, the tournament was different back then. You know, there was no quarterfinal, semifinal, final. Wow. It was just a round robin. It was just a round robin tournament. You played everybody in the tournament once, and the team with the best record won the gold medal. That particular tournament, uh, the Russians that had their worst tournament in world junior history. Mm. And even if they beat us that day, they could finish no higher then sixth place. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> and we had to beat them by five goals in order to win the gold medal. Wow. And we were well on our way. <laughs> we were well, we were well on our way to achieving that goal. And uh, 
So I, I happen to be playing <laughs> with the guy named Everett Everett Santa Pass. If you he's a native know guy, that right? Name. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's a native hockey player. <laughs> oh, that's great. Quebec yeah, he's Nordiques. From, he's from uh, he's from uh, New Brunswick. I think he's a, I think he's a Micmac. Yeah. So, anyways, halfway through the game, uh, there's a whistle, and <laughs> Santa Pass and this Russian guy are yelling and screaming at each other. Wow. One guy in Russian, the other guy in English. So. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I see Santa Pass just drill this Russian guy right in the head <laughs> with his glove on. So they started fighting, and we kind of went over to see what was going on. And I got cross-checked from behind. And then Steve Chase on jumped on the guy that cross-checked me. <laughs> and then next thing you know, everybody on the ice is fighting. And then I look up. And both benches are coming at us, gloves, <laughs> helmets, sticks, flying everywhere. Everybody's throwing punches. Wow! We brawled for about forty-five minutes. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> they turned the lights off, thinking that we would stop fighting. <laughs> That's crazy, man. The refs ran off the ice. We were so exhausted from fighting for oh forty-five minutes. That's kind of how the the brawl ended. Is everything was <laughs> never too was tired. Exhausted. Yeah, it was exhausted. So we cleaned up the ice, and <laughs> we all went into the dressing room, and we were waiting to go back out on the ice and finish the game. And and Dennis McDonald, who was the president of Hockey Canada at the time, basically came in the dressing room and said, we've been disqualified. Get your gear off. Get showered. Oh, my God. Get on the bus. And, and that was it. So... But you had sweet redemption the next year. You yeah. came back and won the gold you medal did. again, right? Right, right in Moscow. Wow. Right. Like, that is such a, like, it's like, <laughs> that's movie stuff. You know, yeah. you can't that's write karma. that. That's karma. That's karma. We need to make, it like, an epic um, Netflix series about that, about that, you know? That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Get a young Theo out there on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that's really cool. You got the gold medal after that. Um, but in 1987, you were drafted in the NHL by the Calgary Flames. And in your first NHL game, you had three assists. That is pretty darn cool. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the process of getting drafted and like celebrating that with your family and like what that what that feels like? You know, I love telling this story <laughs> because there was 415 guys picked ahead of me in the draft. Wow. Okay. So the first year I was eligible, I didn't get drafted. So there was 12 rounds. And then the following year, I didn't get picked until the eighth round, 166 overall. Right. You know, all I ever wanted was an opportunity to, you know, go to a training camp and, uh, you know, thank God the Calgary <laughs> Flames gave me that opportunity. You know, when I showed up at my first training camp, you know, like nobody in the Calgary Flames organization believed, you know, that I could – that I could play in the NHL. Right. They thought I'd be, they thought I'd be a really good player in the minor leagues. And, you know, I'd put some butts in the stands <laughs> and whatnot. You know, by the time I left my first training camp, you know, I turned a whole bunch of non-believers into believers Amazing. that I could maybe one day, you know, play in the NHL. And, and, you know, sure enough, a couple of years later, I got called up on New Year's Day yes. of 1989. <laughs> and then six months later, we were carrying the Stanley Cup around the Montreal Forum. <laughs> oh, awesome. So, this is movie so stuff, yeah. man. This is like big Hollywood it stuff. Out, it worked out pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, man. Oh, I love that. A Stanley Cup in your first year. Rookie season, yeah. And can you remember um, some of the players that were making an impact um, on that team? That team was, well, you think about our four centermen on that team were Joe Noonday, wow, Doug Gilmore, Joel Otto, Theo Fleury. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> That's there a was a reason team. why we won. There was a reason why we won. Mike Vernon, the net, Al McKinnis on D. Oh, my goodness. This is all Hall of Famers. <laughs> yeah. And in 1990, 91, you had another breakout season. Like, all this great stuff is happening. You scored 51 goals and 104 points. Um, and you were named an NHL All-Star. And you were tied for the league lead in minus, uh, plus minus with 
plus 48. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. With Marty McSorley. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Like, what was it about that year where you just like training harder, but more amped, or were you just developing and getting stronger and, and stronger? Well, I, I broke into the league as a, as a centerman. And uh, the year before they traded Joe Mullen to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And in order for me to get more ice time, uh, they moved me to wing. And I played the whole season with Doug Gilmore was oh, my wow. centerman. Oh, my God. And, you know, that's probably the biggest reason why I scored 50 goals that year. Because <laughs> I played with Dougie Gilmore. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, I just kept developing. I just kept getting better, you know, every season, every year. And, and, uh, um, and you know, what was interesting was the year after I scored 50, mm. I think I had – I think I had 30 goals at Christmas that year. Wow. And on January 2nd, they traded Dougie Gilmore to Toronto. Mm-hmm. And I scored eight goals the rest of the year. Wow. Okay. That was a huge so, blockbuster. That was a huge deal for the Leafs. Uh, like they gave up a lot of players, too, to get in me. Eh? Yeah. I don't know. Holy moly. That's insane, man. Um in 1999, you broke Al McKinnis' all-time franchise scoring um, record with uh, the Calgary Flames that stood for 10 years until Mr. Euro McGinley beat it. Yeah. That's pretty darn phenomenal, Theo, like from someone who's coming like with that. An eighth-rounder. Probably the best eighth-rounder of all time. And they thought you were just going to be a minor league player. Like, that's got to feel really cool, man. Like, uh, those kinds of things that are happening, in, in, that they just happen in the course of your career. Um, you played with a lot of um, a few teams: the Colorado, um, the, the Rangers, Rangers. yeah, Blackhawks. Um, but in, and you finished with this is crazy, one thousand and eighty-eight points, dude. Yeah, which is insane. A point a game, an average, a little better. Yeah, sixty-five in all-time points, like top sixty-five of all players in history of hockey. That's really darn cool, man. Did you ever imagine those kinds of things could be possible when you started out and just watching your dad in the senior A levels and stuff? Yeah, not bad for a little mid-chief boy from <laughs> <All right. laughs> You know, my attitude at the beginning was, you know, I just wanted to be, you know, a solid full-time NHL player. And like I said, you know, I just kept getting better and better mm. every year, you know. And, uh, um, you know, more, more responsibility was put on my plate. Uh, you know, uh, I... They put me in a leadership role too. You know, I was captain for a couple of years right. in Calgary and mm-hmm. the slide on the ice. Yeah. The <laughs> yep. slide, you know, and then um, the all-star, the all-star, you had the, the fire on the skates. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, one of my you know, favorites. You know, you, you know, you obviously dream about playing in the NHL and uh, you know, it surpassed every, every dream, every goal, you know, that I had set for myself. And, you know, like I said, playing for Canada 10 times in my career, you know, you know, it was pretty unbelievable. And I got to play with, you know, the greatest players that ever played the game. You know, and uh, yeah, I was. Like the Wayne Gretzky's, the Mario Lemieux's. (laughs) Iserman. (laughs) Iserman, Lidstrom's, all these crazy guys. Stevens. (laughs) That's probably the greatest generation of hockey players, I I believe. And then for you to be right up there amongst the the points leaders, dude, that's saying so, so, so much, man. And um, that is such a great thing that for indigenous people, like we can take that and we're very, we're very proud of that. There's a stat (laughs) that there's only 15 guys in the history of the game mm. that averaged a point a game in the regular season and a point a game wow. in in the playoffs and 14 of those guys are in the hockey hall of fame and the one guy that isn't <laughs> is what? the guy that you're talking to oh right now God. oh man we got to change yeah that. your time's got to be coming <laughs> we got to i'm talk. surprised you're not in there how now. can we how can we rally the troops man we got to get Theo in there. That's yeah. insane. That's not right. That's not right at all. That's an injustice, Theo. I want to talk a bit about the Olympics, because the men's Olympics this time. Um, this is really cool. You talked about playing with the greatest players, and one of the greatest players was obviously Wayne Gretzky, um, who was actually the GM, I believe. The yeah, president. and he also wrote the foreword in your book. 
That's amazing. Um, in 2002, he invited you to come play for Team Canada for your second time. Um, and you helped them win their first gold medal in 50 years, man. Like, that is so cool. Can you tell us a little bit first about uh, what it was like to um, get invited the first time around with Canada and then getting the call back from, from Gretzky and winning it all? Like, can you tell us a bit about that? You know, to be considered, uh, you know, one of the 23 best Amazing. hockey players in all of, in all of Canada. Um, you know, it was fun to be a part of that first dream team that went to Nagano. Um, you know, it obviously didn't end the way that we wanted it to end. And, uh, you know, what a shitty way to, you know, to end the game with an individual skills competition. The shootout, right? Yeah. We, lost, shootout. we lost in a shootout. And, uh, yeah, it was like. To uh, Dominic Hasek, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, I think we learned a lot about what we needed to do going into the next Olympics right. and, uh, you know, you know, that team, that team in 2002, <laughs> I think was, was one of the best teams. Was that in Salt Lake? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, you think about it. I played on the fourth line with Joe Newendike and Brendan Shanahan. Oh, wow. Oh <laughs> what a fourth line. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know if there'll ever be a better team than that. That deep with, like, It'd Hall of Famers. Press, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, who, was, who was playing, like, who was the captain and who was, like, the leaders of that team, Theo? I don't know. All 23. All 23. <laughs> <laughs> Mario was obviously, wow. you know, a big part of that. Um, you know, Joe Sackick and Steve Eiserman, I mm. believe, were the assistant captains, so... You know, can't go wrong. That's then, you know, we had Lindros, we had Marty Brodeur, we had Al McInnes, Chris Pronger, <laughs> Adam, Adam Foot. Yeah, it's that team insane. was sick. You know, that's insane. Ryan, Ryan Smith, Owen Nolan, Captain Canada, yep. <laughs> Mike Pekka. Wow. Yeah. What's it like being in the dressing room and hanging out and doing all the stuff with all with everyone in that space together, you know? Like that's gotta be pretty incredible, eh? I, I was a fanboy, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> well, I remember the first day I walked in the dressing room to see where I was gonna be sitting, mm. right? And I saw my jersey and I looked to the left. I'm sitting beside Mario on my left. And on my right is Joe Sackett. <laughs> wow. You that's know? when you know you made it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move up a little bit. Uh, in 2009, uh, you released your autobiography, which we have a copy of, and you're, yeah. you're reading right now, eh, Harv? Yes, it's a great book. Um, Called Playing With Fire. Playing With Fire. Um, and it's available anywhere you can get a book, uh, like Amazon, Amazon and online, online, anything like that. Um, what was it? What was the draw of um, like becoming and telling your story, Theo? I sort of disappeared from mm. the game, you know? Uh, I had one year left on my deal in Chicago and basically I didn't call them and tell them I was coming to camp. I didn't call wow. my agent. I just, I just left the game and, uh, you know, I thought it was important to, you know, let, let my fans know and, you know, let people around the game know exactly, you know, the reason why. And, you know, obviously it was the very first time I talked about my sexual abuse mm. that happened to me. And, and uh, yeah, and, and writing the book, you know, completely changed my life, you know. And, uh, you know, I since the book came out, you know, which was, what, 13 years ago? Mm -hmm. You know, I've spent you know, the majority of that 13 years helping people, mm. you know, achieve sobriety or help them get over their own abuse and mental illness stuff and, and all that. So it's, uh, yeah, the book really, you know, really changed my life and, and sort of put me in a, you know, in this space, you know, that I've been in for, you know, like I said, the last 13 years. And, you know, I, I, it's been way more rewarding than my actual hockey career. Wow. You know, and I've had probably the biggest impact, um, 
you know, doing this work than I ever did playing hockey. So and that's amazing. Like what you're saying, like uh, that book might have been, it was there for you at the end of your hockey career, you know, which could be a lonely time, you know, or, or you know, when you're isolated a little bit, but getting your story out there and telling people about it is it, that's healing, right? I mean, yeah. It's a lot part of, people, of the healing journey. Right. And a lot of people try to like keep that inside and try to be strong and stuff like that. So, and uh, did you feel like it was really like a release for you while working on the, the book as well? Yeah, the, writing the book was incredibly cathartic. The saying, right? You're only as sick as your secrets. Wow. And and you know, I was I was carrying a secret around for a long time, and I was sick physically, emotionally, and spiritually sick. And hmm. you know, when I when I told my truth, you know, that was the beginning of this healing journey that I've been on. And and uh, you know, I've been to 420 of the 630 first nations communities in Canada wow, awesome. in the last 13 years, you know, working with, you know, residential school survivors and all of the remnants that, you know, were left behind from, from that experience. And, you know, I've done a lot of spiritual healing in the communities, right? Because what I've been taught is, you know, the grandmothers and the grandfathers and the creator left a whole bunch of tools behind mm that they knew that we were going to need to use to heal from the residential school. And so, wow. you know, the smudge, the sweat lodge, powwow, mm. sun dance, rattles, drums, mm. songs, mm. dancing, singing, you know, all those things, That's amazing. Um, you know, I've been able to use for my own healing journey you know awesome. and uh you know i love i love the sweat lodge you know i'm a big sweat lodge guy uh there's a there's a very powerful medicine man that lives two hours south of calgary and i go sit in his sweat lodge at least once a month and wow. you know do some healing and all that stuff so it's been amazing that's great. I'd like to join you in a sweat one day, if not the golf course. Yeah, love there you to. go, man. Yeah, love. maybe both. And we got yeah. a we got a copy of the book right here. Um, and make sure you go check it out. Like, it's so important to get these stories out. Like, um, the overcoming, right? Because they like a lot of the times um, the media and stuff can they they only like to tell the stories of uh, the destruction of indigenous people. You know, they yeah. not too many stories of overcoming. That's why this book's so important. Like for people to to realize you can be at the top of your game. You can be, you can appear to have everything and still be battling these things like inside. Right. So like right. you can't really judge a book by its cover. Right. You don't, you can't. You're right. You know, we don't celebrate our incorrect. Like I believe that the <laughs> Aboriginal people do spirituality better than any right. group on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't talk about our medicine enough. Right. And the power that this medicine has and how healing it is. Mm. And it's all based around community and love and caring and all that. And so, um, you know, I, I, I have this theory about, the residential school mm. and why it was created. So the explorers came first behind the, the uh, explorers came the church mm. and they ran into us. Right. Right. <laughs> well, they saw our spirituality, right? How connected we were to the, to the mother earth and right. the land and all of our medicines and all of our spiritual practices. And they were like, how the hell are we going to have an impact here? Mm. And so what did they do? They created the residential school to take the Indian out of the Indian. That's right. Right. And what happened? Well, they failed. Right. Because we're still on our land. We're still practicing our traditions, Ooh. all that stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, what I sort of talk about when I'm in the communities is I go, just use the tools right. that have been left behind. You know, the drum, the That's rattle, great, mm -hmm. you know, the songs, the sweat lodge, mm. the smudge, you know, and that's where I've done all of my spiritual healing mm. is with all of these tools. You know, a lot of people who went to the residential school were emotionally, physically and spiritually abused. 
And what happened is, you know, when that happens, our spirits leave our body and they, right. they bugger, they bugger off. And so the journey back to self is going and finding that spirit wow. using all of these tools, you know, finding spirit, spiritual healing. Where did you find your voice? Um, to talk in front of people and like you said go to these 400 communities of indigenous people what an impact by the way yeah that you can get right to the heart of the people um but like where did you find your voice theo because it's probably a little bit crazier like we talk about a lot of times a lot of people would prefer death over public speakings right. um that's a proven statistic like where did you find your voice to be able to do that i was sick and tired of being sick and tired mm. right and the one thing i hadn't tried was honesty openness and wow. willingness and then when i told my story i got run over by people who had the same experience as me amazing and they started and they started coming and telling me their stories you know <laughs> and it happens it happens in our communities too i get up on stage and i tell my story and then and then this big conversation starts right right i was, I was abused in the residential school you know other people you, you know, find their voice by listening to my story. Right. And then they start on their journey of healing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's got to feel incredible. Yeah. Your book actually yeah, inspired my cousin to write a book, uh, The Medicine Game, it's called by Delby Paulus. Yeah, we have a copy. Um, if you get a chance to read it, it's a great book as well. It's fictional. But, uh, your book inspired his his book. And his healing journey. We were just listening before we started. We were listening to your song from your album. You're, yes. You released a, a, a album, man. That's so cool. A country album. And the song we were listening to, I think, was um, My Life is a Country My Song. My Life is a Country Song. And what a great production. Holy man, mm -hmm. you had a really good team on that. I'm a producer myself, so where I can hear good production, backup vocals, well-written song, great vocals. That's awesome, man. I didn't you, know you were a crooner. I know you were. <laughs> Could you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> A bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, after I wrote I wrote the book, I was like, geez, if I can write a book, shouldn't be any problem writing <laughs> country. Songs, you know? Right. There, there's a thousand songs in that book. Right. You know? Oh yeah. And uh, you know, I had a couple I got a couple buddies in the music industry and you know, we got together and and uh, uh, we started writing songs Amazing. together. We wrote about uh, we, we wrote about 30 songs and we picked the 10 best songs and found a studio here in Calgary and got a bunch of guys together. And, you know, we, we put this album together and basically what the album is, is it's basically my life in music. Mm. Awesome. All the lyrics are based around recovery. All the lyrics are based around wow. um, uh, my struggles and, you know, and every, you know, Every country song, the first two verses are about the struggle, and then the last verse is about the hope. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. You know? And, uh, you know, I love the process of, of you know, uh, of writing. You know, you take a thought, an, a phrase, an mm. idea, a word, you know, and you turn it into something you know beautiful right especially the band and that when they come in it, it's super magical when you see that idea like balloon to life because it just keeps getting better and better you know that's amazing um you received a doctorate from the university of guelph too for outstanding contributions in canada like that is amazing excellent congratulations on that can you tell us a bit about that yeah. <laughs> dr flurry dr flurry i never thought i'd be a doctor <laughs> An indigenous one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it's nice to be recognized for, you know, all the work that I've, you know, sort of put in and, you know, inspired, you know, a whole new generation of people to find healing and, and uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, being an indigenous person, um, you know, to, to show our people that... Uh, there, there isn't anything you can't overcome. There isn't anything you can't achieve right. when you, you know, when you put your mind to it and, and, uh, you know, trust that, you know, the grandfathers and the grandmothers and the creator are going to take care of you That's on right. this journey as long, yeah. as long as you, uh, you know, practice this amazing, uh, spirituality, mm. you know, which, which has been freely, freely given to me, right. you know, in all of the communities that I've, that I've been to and, 
And, uh, you know, our people are hurting and, and we need, we need to, especially from our leadership, mm. you know, we need, we need for our leadership to start talking about the medicine, you know, right. Stop talking about politics and start <laughs> talking about, start talking about our medicine, right. You know, and getting back to the medicine, getting back to the land and getting back to, mm. you know, the way that we were a long time ago, because that's where all the healing is. It's not in the booze. It's not in the drugs. It's not in the opioids. Right. You know, it's, it's it's getting back to the land. And speaking about that stuff, like you're you're, uh, we talked at the start of the show. You're a motivational speaker now, but I I've, I checked out a bit online, and you have a transformational course that deals specifically with trauma. That is really darn cool, man. Can you talk a bit about that? You know, when I stopped speaking publicly at, when COVID hit, you know, we quickly sort of had to make a you know, a U-turn mm. and, uh, you know, get online because everybody else was doing it. And so we created this trauma transformation course. Wow. And now we have almost 200 members uh, amazing. that are a part of the course. And twice a month we do, uh, we do group therapy on online. Wow. And uh, it's been, it's been incredible. Some of the transformations of people that we've been working with, uh, you know, it's been awesome. I just love that 200 people who probably be before that course probably felt like they were the only ones dealing with that. You know what I mean? Sometimes that trauma, the can, hopelessness that, and the yeah, it can lie to you and say that you're the only one that's dealing with it. No one will understand. Right. So 200 people like that, that's pretty powerful stuff, man. You know, like I said, I've been in this space for 13 years. I've right. learned a lot. Um, you know, I'm an honorary chief now and you know, that's awesome. I take, I, I take a lot of pride in that. Uh, I'm also a pipe carrier as well. Wow. Ace. And, you know, I, I take those responsibilities, you know, uh, very seriously. Right. And, uh, and, you know, I have to lead by example. Right. Mm. And, and, and doing that, you know, I need to practice spirituality every day, you know, light a smudge every morning, mm. I pray, I meditate. You know, I go to powwow, I go to Sundance, you know, I, I, you know, I participate in, in spirituality because, you know, as, as an honorary chief, as a pipe carrier, you know, that's my responsibility. And I take that very seriously. And I, um, you know, I'm honored to have been bestowed with, you know, such responsibility. And, awesome. and so part of that responsibility is, is, you know, being in the communities and talking about you know, these tools. Mm -hmm. We're so excited that we have the one and only Theron Fleury on the Harvin J show. We're so, right. we're so blessed and happy, man. Um, do you have any future goals? Like what, what's going on? What do you think about in the future? I know COVID's starting to um, loosen our restrictions around the world. Um, Canada is starting to get a little bit, we're still a little bit tight, but um, yeah. do you have any um, future plans and stuff? Any albums coming out? Yeah. New ones? Yeah, well, it's been hard to, you know, to like we actually built our own recording studio oh, now. Okay, cool. And so, That's awesome. Awesome. And uh, but we haven't had a chance to get in there and and you know we 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 have a lot of the songs written already for the second album. Amazing. We just haven't had time to uh, you know to get in there and and uh, you know record. So got the scoop, Harv. Yes. <laughs> got the ex exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> well. Exactly. Um, I just want to thank you again, um, Theo, for joining us and sharing your story with us, talking a bit about these amazing events in your life, this like Hollywood movie. It seems like it was a Hollywood movie. Yeah, man. And, it is. And I love the, the redemption in it, um, Theo. I love how uh, you, you overcame turned it. adversity. Yeah, and it went from tragic um, to triumph. And not only are you triumphant in your own life, you are helping so many people and impacting indigenous communities and like you said it has a bigger and it's re more rewarding than your hockey career but i just want to applaud you for all that you're doing um we want to invite you back on the show of course yeah maybe we can get you out here on we'll we'll film while we're on the golf course that'd be great. yeah definitely <laughs> get a golf gig going um yeah is there anything you'd like to say at the to just close it out a bit no it's uh thank awesome. you for asking me to be a part of this and thanks thanks for allowing me to share a little bit about my my life and um i, I love doing indigenous <laughs> podcasts yeah it's awesome. great Woo! 
Now go up. Uh, you know, we need more of this. Right. You know, we need more people, more people talking about, um, you know, residential school, how right. to heal from residential school, you know, talk about our abuse, talk about our drug and alcohol problems. Exactly. You know, I think, you know, we just right. need to, to open up and create a space for, you know, yep. for, that's an amazing point yeah. because a lot of indigenous people just keep things under the carpet, right? And they yeah. don't realize that it's lack gonna... of communication is what really hurts us. Yeah, but yeah. it's going to manifest though too in other ways, right? If you keep things like right. buried and inside, right? So that's a great message. Um, thanks again, and make sure you guys go check out the book "Playing, Playing with Fire", with fire. Um, and his album. Go grab his album. I am who I am too. Um, and uh, we can't wait to chat with you again, uh, Theo. Thank you so much for joining uh, the Harvin J Show. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as we say, as we say in Blackfoot, "Ix sukapi." Yeah. On a gawahi. Thanks, Theo. All right, guys. Take care. <laughs> that was awesome. That was amazing. Wow. <laughs>